Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. And happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. So it was middle of May just last month, and it was a, a warm night. One of those nights where you're like, I don't care what I'm doing. I just want to be outside, right? Mid-70s, just beautiful day. It was that stretch of just amazing weather we had. And so I was out walking my dog. My, our kids were down the street playing with some neighbors, and um, it was one of those nights that was just like everything about it said summer is coming, right? Like we've been waiting for this for months on end, and now it's here. So I'm, I'm walking my dog, and the sun is about to set, so there's like this warm glow in the air. It's like you can feel the glow, and you can see it. And it just feels like everything is right in the world, right? My dog is on his best behavior. <laughs> My kids are playing with neighbors. That's part of the reason why we wanted to move to that street because there's more kids. And I'm listening to Spotify, just listening to music. And one of my favorite songs comes on in this moment. And I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude and peace. And it's like if I could find a way to capture this moment, bottle it up, put it on, in a sh on a shelf, and then pull it out, you know, whenever I wanted to experience it. Ah, oh, that would be amazing. You ever have moments like that? It's like everything in the world just seems to be right. And so I'm, I'm starting to make my way back to the house because I got to go clean the kitchen and pick up after dinner. And I extend my walk just a few more blocks just to linger in that moment a little bit longer. Eventually get back to the house and I'm starting to get the dog settled, starting to clean up the kitchen. And that peaceful moment that I had was abruptly disrupted by one of my kids busting into the house, screaming hysterically. Like if you're a parent, you've heard one of these screams before and it makes you think, do I need to go to the ER? right? Like, I don't know what has happened. I don't know what the situation is, but somebody might have broken a bone. Somebody might have been hurt really bad. And so I'm in the kitchen, and my, my daughter just runs past me to the bathroom, and I see red, like, all over her. And I go to see what's going on, and she pulls her hands away from her face, and there's a blood pool in her hands. So then a whole new set of questions starts circling in my mind. Like, was there a fight with the neighbor kids? Did somebody throw something at her? Did somebody punch her? What happened? And then right behind her are her two sisters, and they told us what happened. They were jumping on a trampoline, and she happened to jump just in the right way, or you could say just in the wrong way, and hit her sister square in the nose, and poof, a flood of blood just started to flow. So now we were able to pretty quickly recover, uh, you know, her face, and she didn't need to go to the ER, stop the bleeding, and then we were able to finish out the night pretty well and put our kids to bed. But what had happened in that moment, you had this like juxtaposition of two very different experiences of like peace and calm and then chaos. The peace that I had was immediately disrupted. And we would call the peace that I was experiencing in that moment like circumstantial peace, like situational peace. Everything in the world seemed to be right. Now, fortunately, in that moment, even though it was disrupted, I was able to recover that peace because by the time the kids went, went down to bed, I could sit on the couch and just enjoy the quiet of the evening. But there's other circumstances and other situations where when the peace you experience in a context is disrupted, it's a whole lot more challenging to recover that peace. And we would call one of those situations communal peace or organizational peace, meaning within the scope of a community or, or an organization, when the peace is disrupted, especially a community like the church, it's a whole lot more challenging to recover that peace. I can remember a couple years into pastoral ministry, and I was in a congregational meeting at our church where we were serving, and the peace of that congregation 
had been completely disrupted. There was tension between the pastor and the elder board, and it was starting to leak out into the church, and there was all of the speculation as to what was going on, and so the elders decided to call a meeting to talk about it with the the church, and it was one of those meetings where questions were asked, and accusations were given, and yelling, and arguments started to happen, and it was just this colossal mess. And I remember sitting there in the back like, is this what ministry is supposed to be like? Because when you have, like, a church is a very complex web of relationships. And when those relationships on an organizational level are disrupted, it's really hard to nurture all of those relationships and bring that piece back together. A couple years ago, there was a a really popular podcast that surfaced called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill that talked about the, the... kind of surge to popularity of a certain pastor on the West Coast and the the rapid growth that they experienced as a church. But then over the course of a few months, because they grew too fast and they, they couldn't scale and there wasn't health in the organization, almost overnight, this massive church that had multiple campuses and tens of thousands of people crumbled and closed its doors because there was no peace internally. It was all masked by growth, but there was no true peace that existed. And so it raises the question for us, like how does a church maintain a culture of peace? Because what's at stake for a church when peace is disrupted is our ability to be an effective witness and to be on mission in our community. If a church can't maintain peace and there's just conflict and infighting and it starts to leak out into the community, it jeopardizes the witness that we have with the community. And so the question is, how does a church maintain peace in a world where peace is so absent and so needed? Our passage this morning in 1 Thessalonians 5, as we wind down this book, speaks to that very question and names how it is a church can maintain peace. And this is where Paul begins. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 12. Paul writes, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Now, Paul is going to end 1 Thessalonians with a string of directives. He's going to list out in just a few moments a a list of about 15 commands that he's expecting the church in Thessalonica to follow. And that's not unusual for Paul. In many of his letters, he has sections where he just in rapid fire uh, succession lists all of these things. But before he does that here, he starts to talk about the leadership of the church in Thessalonica. Now, he's not speaking to the leaders. Rather, he's speaking to the church at large specifically about their attitude, what their attitude should be towards the leaders of the church. And basically, he's saying you should respect and honor your leaders. He goes on to say this in verse 13, hold them, meaning those who lead the church, in in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. Now, we live in a day and age where leadership, any leadership, is under scrutiny and oftentimes approached with suspicion. And rightly so, because I would say we are experiencing a leadership crisis in just about every sphere of our society, and it's no exception in the church. And partially why we are experiencing a leadership crisis is because there's a sense of entitlement amongst leaders in all spheres of society. So a couple months back, it was actually probably back in February, I was having coffee uh, with another pastor in the area. He's actually the pastor who's going to be my mentor while I'm on sabbatical. And part of the reason why I asked him to be my mentor was because of this conversation. We were having coffee. He's a pastor who's probably in his early to mid-50s, been at the place he's at now for about 20 years. And I was just asking him how he remained faithful in his church over the years. And one of the things that surfaced in our conversation was entitlement. And how he, at a certain point in his ministry, started to feel entitled. Like, I could do whatever I want. I've dedicated my life to this church. This church is what it is because of the way that I have led this church. The success and the faithfulness that we're experiencing is because of my leadership. And he said there came a point when he was confronted with that, and he really had to do business with that. And he said a lot of leaders go sideways when they step into an entitlement mindset, and they just walk in that, 
and it creates all sorts of dysfunction in the church. And he said, had I not had some good, godly, gracious people around me to walk me through that season, who knows where I would be or where the church would be? Because when we enter into a posture of entitlement, we start to prioritize ourselves over the organization or the people that we lead, and we think, oh, these people are here to actually serve me rather than the other way around. And so there's this phrase that you've probably heard before, that leaders shape culture. So if a leader grows entitled, they will probably become an unhealthy leader, which will lead to an unhealthy culture. But if a leader can stay humble and honest with who they are, they can become a healthy leader that could ultimately shape a healthy culture. But it's not just about health or unhealth, because the characteristics that a leader embodies will ultimately find their way into the DNA of your church. So meaning, if you have a leader who is a kind leader, there's a good chance the culture they lead will become a kind culture. If you have a leader who is a generous leader, hopefully the culture of the church that they lead will become a generous culture. Same with serving. If they are a servant leader, hopefully they will develop a serving culture. But the reverse of that is also true, meaning if they are an anxious leader, they probably will start to foster an anxious culture. If they're angry, they will foster an angry culture. If they're insecure, the culture of the organization will become insecure because leaders oftentimes are the ones who primarily shape culture. There's a book uh, by a guy named Simon Sinek called Leaders Eat Last. He's one of the best voices out there, in my opinion, from a secular standpoint on servant leadership. And so he opens this book with the story of a guy named Bob Chapman. Bob Chapman is the CEO of a, a company that kind of owns a bunch of manufacturing companies. And in the mid-90s, Bob was buying up these companies that were in decline. They were dysfunctional and kind of on their way out. And it turned many of them around. And the way that he turned the company around was he would go into these organizations and he would just start listening to the employees. He, he, he bought up all these companies that were tanking and now I think they're worth like $9 billion. He's wildly successful. And the thing they're known for is healthy workplace cultures. And the way that he would do it is going in and just start to listen to employees from all different levels of the organization to find out how they experience working at that company. So the book opens with a story of him sitting down with one individual in particular who, who had just gotten back from a trip to another country. I think it was Puerto Rico. He was installing some of their equipment in another company. And Bob sits down with this guy. He's like, so tell me what it's like to work at this company. And his first response is, if I tell you the truth, will I have a job tomorrow? And Bob says, if anybody gives you trouble about anything tomorrow, you come and talk to me right away. And he said, what's interesting is when I was in Puerto Rico installing this, this equipment, I felt way more freedom there than I do here. As soon as I walked back in here, it was like my freedom was gone. We have these bells that ding that tell us when we're allowed to go on break and when we can have like go to the bathroom or get a cup of coffee or go get a soda. If a machine breaks down and I need to get a part, they're all under lock and key in this storage closet as though you think we're just going to walk in there and steal these spare parts and take them home with us. And what makes matters worse, the executives of this company, we all walk through the same door. At the beginning of the day, they go right, we go left. And they operate very differently than we do. They have like, it's like you're almost running two different companies here. And they have all this freedom, but yet we experience what seemingly is distrust. So Bob hears all this and right away starts to make changes and gets rid of the lock and key for the spare parts, gets rid of the bells that ding that tell them when they can take a break. And over time, the culture of the organization shifts to one where people feel trusted, they feel empowered, they feel freedom, and there's a sense of family atmosphere that starts to develop. Because he goes on to tell another story of that same company a year or so down the road, uh, one of the employee's wife was diagnosed with diabetes and was possibly going to lose her leg because of the disease, and he was running out of PTO time. So he was in this place of, how do I keep caring for my wife? 
and have an income. And all these other employees started to hear about this, and they started transferring some of their PTO days to him, which at the time was actually against company policy. Like, company policy didn't allow that to happen, but they did it anyway because the culture of the organization had shifted to the point where it was more important to care for the employees than to use the employees. And it all started because Bob comes in, he sits down, he has conversation, he listens, and he cares because leaders shape culture. Now, because of what has been said about the church in Thessalonica through the letter, it's probably fair to assume that the leaders are healthy leaders. Because Paul says, if you go back to verse 12, like, honor those who work hard among you and who care for you. It appears that those who are leading the church in Thessalonica do care for those who are attending there. Because as you read through the letter, there's all of these positive things that are said about the church. Like if you were to compare the church in Thessalonica with the church in Corinth, wildly different churches. Church in Corinth is very dysfunctional, but the church in Thessalonica seems to be really healthy because when you hit chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, we instructed you on how to live to please God, and it appears that you're doing it. And then he goes on to say, chapter 4, verse 9, and we don't need to, to write to you about your love for one another. Like, we don't need to further instruct you on how to love one another because you are doing it more and more. You love all of God's family. And then he says in chapter 5, verse 11, our, our, our charge to you is to encourage one another and build each other up as, in fact, you are doing so it's fair to assume that if the church is operating this way, it's probably because the leaders are operating this way, because leaders shape culture. So he starts this section of the letter speaking not to the leaders, but speaking about the leaders. And then from there, he gives his first directive. His first directive in his string of commands, at the end of verse 13, is live in peace with each other. Meaning, if the church is going to be a peaceful church, it starts with leaders, because peaceful leaders will shape a peaceful culture. So it's fair to assume that Paul is, in some ways, saying this to the leaders, even though he's not addressing the leaders. But at the same time, again, he's not speaking to the leaders, he's speaking to the church at large, because it's not just the leaders who have the responsibility to shape the culture of a church, everybody who attends the church has that same responsibility. Because in a church this size, there's this wild web of relationships. Everybody's going to interact with everybody else in ways where you have the, the decision to sow seeds of peace or not. Because Paul goes on to say this in verse 14. He says, we urge you, brothers and sisters. He uses that term, brothers and sisters, 15 times throughout the letter to speak to the church at large, saying all of you have responsibility in this. All of you are called to engage in the ministry of the church in a way that fosters the mission of the church and shapes the culture of the church. Because Paul knows that a church is about relationship. It's not just about leadership. It's about relationship, about the relationships that exist between people. And notice how Paul over these next few verses, speaks to the idea of how we act towards one another. He'll use the term each other and everyone four times. Well, two each in the span of just a few verses. He's already said that once in verse 13 when he said, live in peace with who? With each other. Saying you have the responsibility, it's not just your leaders, but everybody has the responsibility to live in peace with each other. Through 14 and 15, he will use similar language three more times. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, to warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with who? Everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do good for who? Each other and for everyone else. He's emphasizing the fact that everybody 
and a church family has responsibility to sow seeds of peace and live in peace with each other. Now, in talking about peace in reference to the wider relationships of the church, it doesn't mean that if there is peace, there is no conflict. Like, the idea of peace doesn't mean there's an absence of conflict. Sometimes, as Christians, we think that, right? Because sometimes we think conflict is bad, and therefore, if we're experiencing conflict, we're not being Jesus-like, and we're being unchristian, so what do we do? We just avoid conflict. We just pretend like it's not there rather than engaging with conflict. And the conflict doesn't just magically go away. It actually stews below the level like it, or below the surface. It just kind of like bubbles up there and starts to leak out and come up. And then we push it back down to pretend that it's not there. So when Paul says he gives the imperative to live in peace, he's not assuming there's no conflict, but rather it informs how we are called to handle conflict, right? Um, At the beginning of this letter, Paul in chapter 1, verse 3, commends the church in Thessalonica for their work ethic. He's praising God. He's thanking God for the church in Thessalonica. In chapter 1, verse 3, he says, we thank God for your work produced by faith and your labor prompted by love. The church in Thessalonica is a hard-working church. It was evident to Paul, and he's thanking and praising God for their work produced by faith, their labor prompted by love. But notice what he says here, and notice how he says to, to engage with those who aren't doing that, because apparently there were some in Thessalonica who weren't working hard, right? He says in verse 14, warn those who are idle, and disruptive. It seems as though there are some in Thessalonica who weren't working hard. They weren't putting in the effort that they were supposed to. They were just like skating under the radar, hoping to maybe mooch off other people. Hey, we're just going to do the bare minimum. We're not going to show up today, but hey, can you support me? And some people speculate that the reason this is an issue in Thessalonica, because it surfaces again in 2 Thessalonians, There was this expectation that Jesus is going to return soon, so why do I have to work hard? Like, Jesus is coming back, so why don't we just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow? He may come back. Let's just live it up and not have to worry about these things. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Like, be diligent. Do your work. Keep sowing seeds, because you don't know when the time is that he will return. So here he's saying, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Now, the term here for warn can also be translated admonish. Anybody familiar with admonish? Like, we don't use that term a lot in our society, but we do speak to this idea of warn. But the term admonish actually comes with positive undertones with it. Some scholars will say that to admonish somebody is to put positive pressure on people rather than negative pressure. Like, this is something that I'm continually growing in with my kids, because I'm quick to put negative pressure on my kids when I think they're not doing what they should be doing. You're fighting with your sister? Get over here, sit down, and shut up. Everybody sit on the couch until I say you can talk, and then when I talk, I'm going to go down the line and tell you what you're doing wrong, and what you're doing wrong, and what you're doing wrong, and how you should live better, and how you should obey me, and how you should be nice. Now get out of here and go do it. That's negative pressure, right? It's negative pressure. Positive pressure would be like, all right, so what happened? Okay, she did that. Well, how did you respond? Well, why did you respond that way? So what do you think a better solution would have been to solving that problem with your sister? Do you think you guys could try that? Because here's what I think. I think that being in this family means we love each other. And I would love to see you guys love each other and live in such a way where we can live in peace together right? That's admonishing somebody in a positive way to call them up to something rather than just telling them you're doing something wrong and bad and stop doing it. So Paul is using words here that tend to be more positive in nature rather than negative when he's talking about confronting those who aren't living the way that they're living. Because the list of directives in this passage is that we are called to warn or admonish people. We are called to encourage them. We're called to help them. We're called to be patient with them. 
and to make sure, make sure things go the way they do. And the reason I think Paul is using these terms is because through the second half of the book, he makes it a point to say over and over to the church in Thessalonica that you are called to be distinct and different from the world around you. The religious term that he will use to describe that is holy, that you are called to be holy. Holy just means you are set apart, that you are distinct, that you are different than everything else. And as a church, we are called to be distinct in part in the way we navigate conflict. Because the assumption is conflict will happen, right? We are people who are broken. We are people who are sinful. We are people who are selfish. We are people who prioritize ourselves over others. Conflict is going to be present, but the way that we can be distinct in the world is by resolving conflict, moving into and through conflict in a way that is much more positive than the rest of the world. When I was a sophomore in college, I, my first two years of college, I lived away from home about an hour and a half, two hours. And going into Christmas break, I made the decision to stay at school for those six weeks in between semesters. I was going to go home for Christmas, be there for just a few days, go back to school, and I was going to work for those six weeks to make as much money as I could before the next semester started. So I got a job at a seafood restaurant, and I was going to be the fry guy for six weeks. So I was going to deep fry shrimp and cod and whatever other stuff you could put in a fryer for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, right? And it was one of the most smelly, messy jobs I ever had. So you're literally, they, somebody orders fried shrimp. So you take fr- shrimp, put it in batter, scoop it out, put it in the fryer, and just sit there. And all of this, like, grease is just, like, coming and covering your clothes. I drive home from work, throw my clothes on the floor, go take a shower, walk back in, and you could just smell the restaurant wafting from the corner of the room. So I did this job for one day before I went home for Christmas break just to get acclimated. I got home, spent a a great week at home, and I was like, why would I want to go back and smell like fish for a month? Like, why would I do that? So I made the decision not to go back to school, but just to stay home, find another job, spend the month with my family, and then go back. So I had to call my boss, and I had to tell him, like, hey, I made a decision, something happened, I'm not going back to school for the month of January, I'm just going to stay home. And as as soon as I told him that, like, he lost it. I mean, you could hear the restaurant noise in the background, and he was yelling, and he was swearing, and he was just like, how could you do this to me? And then didn't even say bye, but just hung up the phone. And I was like, maybe I dodged a bullet. Like, maybe I dodged a bullet not having to spend a whole month with that hothead, and I could be at home. But I remember in that moment realizing, like, I think this is pretty normative for how people deal with conflict. When things don't go their way, they lose it. They use fear, they use guilt, they use manipulation to try and force people to conform whatever they want. And that's how we keep peace in our world, by conforming people, by lording power and authority over them to force them into something that we think is best for them because it's ultimately what we want more than what they want. And what if the church saw conflict resolution as an opportunity to bear witness to the world that that there's a different way to work through confrontation that brings peace, trust, empowerment, and freedom. And so the question for us is how do we become that people? I mean, we first have to ask, do we want to be that kind of people? Because it's a whole lot more challenging to work through conflict that way. It's really easy to use guilt, manipulation, and fear to force people to do what you want. Like, that's actually pretty effective most of the time. But it's a whole lot more challenging to enter into conflict with people in a way that works through conflict to restore peace and bring about a culture that's caring and loving. So do we want that? And how do we become that? This is what Paul says next in verse 16. He says, rejoice always. Conflict can easily steal your joy because it's hard, it's difficult, it's messy, it's uncomfortable. But did you know that you have the ability to choose joy? And I'm not talking about a fake happiness, like everything's fine in my world, and it's really not. Like joy is this 
undercurrent of contentment in my life. That even when things are chaotic, like, I am going to be okay. So therefore, I can choose joy today. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, pray continually. Pray continually, not just once a week, not just when you're at church, continually. Because when you pray, it's this acknowledgement that I need God in my life. I'm dependent on Him. My source of joy comes from Him because when circumstances are out of my control, I can have joy and confidence that I'm in partnership with the God of the universe who's holding all things together, and He's going to lead me through this. And therefore, He says in verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, even when things are hard and it's like life is falling apart, if you have eyes to see, you can identify that there are good gifts from God in your life, even in those seasons. So when you hit hard times, when you deal with difficult people, it's easy, hopefully easy to say like, but this over here, this is a good gift from God. And I'm going to give him thanks for this. This person in my life in this season is such a blessing. So I'm going to choose to give thanks to God for that person. And see, what worship does, because that's what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about worship, both on a personal level, because you have the power to choose joy. You have the power to give thanks. You have the ability to continue to pray. So you personally can always be engaging in worship. But it's not just on a personal level, it's also on a corporate level. Because these verbs here, rejoice, give thanks, and pray, are, this is for all you grammar nerds out there, are second person verbs, right? It's a meaning of you do this. The you isn't supplied there, but the you is there. It's implied. But it's not a you singular, it's a you plural. Y'all. Y'all rejoice continually. Y'all pray without ceasing. Y'all give thanks So worship is both a personal and a corporate exercise. And what worship does is it gives you access to supernatural spiritual power. Because Paul, in the next couple verses, he he talks about things that seem to be more supernatural. He says, don't quench the spirit, right? Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. Now, a lot could be said about those verses, because what does it mean to quench the Spirit? What does the Spirit do? Well, the Spirit empowers us. Paul will say in uh, in Ephesians 1, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. That's a whole lot of spiritual power to raise somebody from the dead, and you have access to that, right? I'm not totally sure what he's saying about prophecies here. Maybe it's something that's happening in the context of the Thessalonian church, But he's saying, don't resist those things. Enter into them with wisdom and discernment. Don't resist spiritual things. Come at them with wisdom and discernment. Embrace embrace what's appropriate because it actually brings power into your life. And we might need power to do, we might need supernatural, spiritual power to do even some of the most basic things in our world. Go back to verse 14. One of Paul's directives and commands is to be patient. He says, be patient with who? With everyone. Be patient with everyone. That person who's driving 25 miles an hour on the interstate when you're supposed to be going 60, be patient with that person. They might be a new driver and scared out of their mind. That person who can't seem to work the self-checkout kiosk at Metro Market, and they keep calling the person over to punch in their code to help them scan things, and the line is backing up all the way through the, the aisle behind you, be patient with that person because who knows what's going on in their life. When your kids are causing you to run late for church and they're fighting and they're arguing and you're just like, we got to get to church and shut up so we can go worship the Lord, right? Like, Be patient with your kids. It's really easy to say, oh yeah, be patient with everyone, but it's a whole lot harder to actually exercise patience. And sometimes we need supernatural spiritual power to help us simply exercise patience. And what worship does is worship reminds us 
that we need God in our life because I'm selfish, because I prioritize myself over everybody else. I think the world revolves around me. I need God to continually remind me that I need his help in all things to become a person who sows seeds of peace. Now, sometimes Paul's list of directives seem pretty random, Right? They're kind of all over the place. And maybe he's just like grabbing all these things that he didn't have enough time to fit into his letter and he's just lining them up. But part of me wonders if there's some intentionality to how he orders these things. Because he first talks about leadership within the church. And then he talks about the wider relationships that people have. And then he speaks to the idea of worship. And ultimately what worship does is worship points you back to God. It takes the focus of your world off of yourself, off of each other, and points everybody together back to him. And that's where Paul ends this letter. He says in verse 24, may God himself. It's about God. At the end of the day, it's all about him. We are his. This church is his. This world belongs to him. We are simply stewards and servants, and he has gifted us the opportunity to be in this place. It's all his his. And notice how he's described, right? We started this list of directives with live in peace with everyone. And here he says, may God himself, the God of what? Peace. May the God of peace sanctify you. And sanctification is the same idea of what it means to become holy, to become distinct, to be set apart. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. It's your whole being because worship not just brings your mind or your attention to God, it's your whole being because he goes on to say, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is one of my favorite verses of all time, verse 24. Because the one who calls you is faithful. Have you experienced that recently? That God is faithful in your life? He is always faithful, even when we are unfaithful. He is always there, even when we're running the other direction. He is always present, even when it seems like maybe he's absent. And then it says, he will do it. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Well, what will he do? He is the one who will sanctify you. Christianity isn't some self-sanctification project. It's a surrender project. It's putting yourself daily before him through worship, prayer, joy, and thanksgiving, saying all of life is one big colossal gift. And I am so grateful to have that gift. And I'm going to submit myself to you today. And the result is peace will start to take hold of your life. Because what Paul, I think, is trying to say here is that peace comes when we pursue Jesus. When we pursue him in worship and adoration, we experience his peace and we become people of peace. So the question we have to end with this morning is how can we as individuals sow seeds of peace in our community, in our church? And what if this next week, You took the posture of going back to verse 16, 17, and 18 and focused on three things, joy, prayer, and thanksgiving. Daily you woke up and you said, I'm going to choose joy today. I'm going to find contentment at work in my life today, and I'm going to pray because I'm going to trust that God is with me, so I'm going to speak to him throughout the day, and I'm going to look for all sorts of things to give thanks to today. What if you did that every day? And what if you just did it as an experiment to see how it changed your perspective about who you are, the people around you, and the circumstances that you're in? And maybe you would find that instead of anxiety, insecurity, and anger surfacing, oh, it was peace, contentment, and joy. And you had this strong sense of confidence that everything is going to be okay. And it might even change the way people around you perceive who you are in the midst of of it all. Now, what I think is kind of funny about this passage is it ends with a really strange last directive. Paul says, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Makes sense. Pray for Paul. And then he says, greet all God's people with a holy kiss. 
I don't think, I think that's maybe the only place in scripture where it commands us to kiss one another. Today's my last Sunday before I go on sabbatical. You're all getting a big sloppy kiss from me, all right? Well, maybe we'll back that up. Maybe just a hug. How about we start with that? One guy walked up to me after first service. He's like, this is as sentimental as I get, Brian. And he gave me a fist bump. I'm like, I'll take it. Thanks, man. But you probably only have a church that has a culture of peace who could actually even read that and not be like, ew, that's weird, right? But they're like, yeah, like, again, back it up to a hug. Like, why wouldn't I hug my brothers and sisters in Christ? Because we're family. And when we pursue Jesus together, and we pursue the peace that he has for us, there's this natural affection where I can be patient with people. I can love people, even when they drive me crazy, even when they're difficult, because they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And when the world sees us operating in that way, they say, wow, that's different. Maybe even a little weird, but there's something attractive about it. And it all starts by pursuing Jesus. So may the peace of Christ rule your hearts in your mind. May you worship God continually and find that he sanctifies you through and through. And may you trust that he is faithful, that he has called you, and that he will do it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the goodness and the graciousness that you have bestowed on us through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, in these last few minutes, as we wind down our time together, that we would feel your spirit at work stirring something in us to remind us of who we are in you, that we are people who cultivate peace, that we are called to be peacemakers, not just peacekeepers, but peacemakers, and that we could bring a, a, a new sense of safety, of care, of compassion to the places in our world. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen.